My name is Marsa Fraser, and I'm the Special Collections Librarian here at Williamson County Public Library. I have the best job in the whole library, in the best place, I think. And I think there are people who might agree with me. Um, and Walter would be one of them because we see him as well as some other regular patrons up there. We're all about genealogy and local history, so come see us if you haven't. Just need to tell you a few things. Um, this program is being filmed. If you didn't notice the camera in the back, WCTV is here. So later we'll be able to watch this program on TV at home if you didn't hear everything. So that'll be a nice thing to be able to do. I do need you to silence your cell phones, please. And uh, on the back table here, as you're leaving, if you would like to have some say about the programs we offer here at Williamson County Public Library, we would love for you to fill out a feedback form and give us your ideas. Let us know if you like the programs we give and um, any suggestions you might have. That's much appreciated. And now I want to say a few words about our guest tonight, Walter Green. He is a retired, he's retired from a career in civil and structural engineering with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and later in consulting but he stayed very busy doing things like researching and writing books. He's also written extensive study reports for the city of Franklin, as well as local history articles for the Williamson County Historical Journal. Although Walter grew up in Nashville and lived there throughout his career, he retired in Franklin. He is very proud of the fact that much of his family history is right here in Franklin, all the way back to the Revolutionary War. He is happily married, and I'm glad to see his wife, Wheezy, here tonight, and has three daughters and eight grandchildren. He is also a great friend of the library. The Nashville Indicator in the Civil War is, is Walter's first book, and he's also the first to write a book about the Nashville Indicator Railroad. And if you're interested and want to get a copy, we will, he will have them for sale after the program for $35 each. That's kind of a special event price too. So um, we hope you enjoy the show. It's my great pleasure to welcome our friend, Walter Green. You don't know how surprising it is that I'm up here because engineers aren't best known for their speaking necessarily, but when you, but when you have a passion for something and you know the topic, then it's okay. I love talking about this and you're going to figure out pretty soon that this isn't just about the book. It wasn't about making money on a book. It's really about sharing the story and then hopefully eventually rebuilding the 1901 LNN depot here in Franklin. That is my ultimate goal. And so by spreading the word, that, that helps with that. Marcia, thank you so much for having me. I, the book wouldn't be like it is if it weren't for the library. I, I spent a lot of time here. And even more than that, I got a lot of books through interlibrary loan that were terribly important for me. So how does an engineer who is a numbers guy end up researching and writing a book? Like Marcia said, I had my career in Nashville, and when I retired, I felt a pull to come to Franklin. I lived in one grandparent's house in Nashville, and I was able to buy and live in another grandparent's house here that came into the family in, in 1920. So it's been in the family for 102 years now. So I was pulled to come to Franklin, and when I got here about eight years ago, I, I got settled in, and I got a really good feel for Franklin. I've been here before visiting family, but I got a really good feel for Franklin. And the first thing that jumped at me was this lovely town did not have a passenger depot. It has the freight depot where PD's is in the gravel lot over at South Margin and First. But so many great little towns have a, a depot, a, a passenger depot. It's so different from a freight depot. Good, good cities have great libraries. We have that. And I thought, well, 
a depot would be something I can really sink my teeth into. So I thought, I'll research the depot. And Rick Warwick helped me a lot with, with facts and, and pictures, and I went to get the deeds and all that. And as I researched it, people said, Walter, you're already researching that depot. Why don't you just go a little farther along the railroad? Calvin Leahy did and Wheezy did. And nobody can tell you to go research a book. I spent 3,500 hours on this book. You can't just say, I think I'll write a book. It's got to be a passion. And it's, there was a flame in me that was ignited by, by all this. So I did. I researched up and down the railroad from Nashville to Decatur. I went to, to Washington, D.C., to the Library of Congress and the National Archives. And I did my due diligence, diligence on the book. It's written kind of like a textbook. There's nothing in here that's not, to the best of my knowledge, factual. And I didn't make any of this up. I just found it and compiled it and wove it together and chopped it into chapters and put pictures in it and was fortunate enough to get it published. So that's how I, that's how I got excited about it. And why am I excited about the, the book? First of all, I figured that the Civil War has many stories. There are houses, there are generals, there are battles, but there's also the railroad. And the railroad had been sort of overlooked. It's, in, it's the backstory of many stories, many books, but it hadn't really gotten enough attention as far as I'm concerned. And the tracks are right there. You can't forget this railroad. We hear trains a lot, and the tracks are right where they were in 1860. They might change in elevation, and the bridges and trestles are all changed. That railroad is still there as a reminder, just like the battlefields. Plus, nobody had ever written a book about this railroad. So it all lined up to me, and I said, I better get on it. I better hurry. So six years later, fortunately, somebody else hadn't written a book about it. But it's, I, I may be slow, but I'll, I'll get it done, and it'll be, it'll be thorough, and I'll be happy with it. So that's what happened here. So there's the depot, 1901, the last l and depot here that was torn down about 1959. That's what I'd like to see rebuilt. Okay, the railroad itself. And as I said, I gotta go back and forth here. So I'll start over here, because I'm right-handed. Nashville, Decatur. Decatur Junction is kind of important, and the tunnel is kind of important. Two features I'm gonna hit on as we go through this. So in the 1850s, the Nashville and Chattanooga had been built, the Memphis and Charleston had been built. And if you will, those are two of the three legs in a loop. So those two were in place. Finally, in the late 1850s, work was performed and completed in November 1860, Nashville to Decatur. And the last piece to be built was the tunnel. It, it gave problems. And then, so it really wasn't just a Nashville and Decatur Railroad. I use that term for simplicity. There were really three railroads working together that, that shared the line and that shared some equipment and that cooperated on their schedules and what have you. They were the Tennessee and Alabama from Nashville to Columbia, plus the line to Mount Pleasant, the Central Southern, Columbia to the state line, and then Tennessee and Alabama Central to Decatur Junction. And Decatur Junction is a kind of important thing to, to be aware of because that was the end of the railroad right there. The Nashville and Decatur didn't make it to Decatur. There's Decatur on the south side of the Tennessee River. The river was running wild back then. There were no locks and dams. So there's Decatur. That's the Y where trains could go different directions, could turn around and what have you. Didn't quite make it to Decatur, but what are you gonna call it? It's, it's a Nashville and Decatur Railroad. So this is a Franklin group. I picked out the maps that relate to Franklin. There's the Davidson County line, and here's the railroad, and the crossings. There are numerous crossings, bridges and trestles. This is a crossing at the Little Harpeth River in Brentwood, and then Spencer Creek near McHatcher Parkway in Franklin. Then here's Fort Granger. There was a bridge there, of course. There's still a bridge there at Fort Granger. Then going south, the West Harpeth was a crossing, and then you didn't hit another one until you got into, into Murray County. And so it, there, wasn't a, there weren't a lot of crossings up here, many more to the south, where it was hilly and creaky and rivery. But those are the crossings in, in our county. 
what did the railroad consist of? Well, they had locomotives. There's one guy in this room who's real familiar with these. That's Mr. Bird. That's the current, a current diesel, and that's the, that's the old-timey one. I put these to scale the best I could to show you how much smaller the Civil War era wood burning with a tender car locomotive was than, than today's. The, um, the new one, the current one, weighs about eight times as much as the, as the old one. Of course, it's diesel instead of, instead of wood, and it's an electronic whistle instead of steam. Of course, we, we see the locomotives today pulling a lot of cars. The locomotives back then would pull an average of about, about 10 because they weren't that strong. And this is the best picture I could find of an old locomotive, box cars, flat cars, and passenger cars with Federals riding on top. I, the first talk I ever gave on this was to a bunch of kids in this room. And I asked the parents asked, and the kids, you think it's a good idea to ride on top of a car? <laughs> and the mom said, no, no. And the kids knew that they, they wouldn't do that anyway. But no, we don't do that without good reason. I guess they were protecting the train. So bridges and trestles, there were a lot of them. This is the oldest picture of, of a Civil War structure in Franklin that I know of. And that's the bridge over the Harpeth River, which is near Fort Granger. And this, one was, this picture was taken in early 1864. This is not what, a, what the bridge would have looked like when the railroad built it. It would have been more rugged looking and not quite as refined. This was built later by a company in Chicago where they manufactured, they prefabricated these in Chicago and brought them down and put them in place. You can see how, that's, that's really pretty. It looks like it was made in a factory. And that was a newer design. You can see some vertical steel rods there. This is an early version of when steel was becoming incorporated in, into the, the bridges. That's the structural engineer in me coming out, I'm sorry. So that's the oldest bridge in, in Franklin. Then there were trestles. And because this area up here was so flat, there wasn't a need for trestles. But down farther south, there were. And the biggest one was in northern Alabama, the Sulphur Creek Trestle, which is very famous for the, the worst, the most prolific land battle in north Alabama during the Civil War, Sulphur Creek Trestle. Uh, Nathan Medford Forrest got hold of that and had a ball. He, he lit quite a fire with that thing. So, the bridges are all steel now. The trestles have all been replaced by embankments because they are, they're more economical. They're expensive to build, but they're gonna last, whereas wood would, would not. And there was one tunnel, which was the biggest find for me when I researched the railroad. This is south of Pulaski, north of the Elk River, and it's in Madry's Ridge near Prospect, Tennessee. It was the only railroad on the line, 20, about 15 feet, and it's still there, but the ceiling is falling in, which is that's kind of what happens. And it was outdated because the locomotives got larger and cars got larger, and it didn't make sense to use this. So another line was put on the other side of I-65 to, to bypass this, this tunnel. And the, the tracks have all been taken up, but I've been there a couple of times. It's really, with permission, it's really pretty fascinating. And so much happened there. I'll talk about it again in a few minutes, but. To me, this tunnel area and the six miles, a couple of miles either side of it, was the most fascinating area during the Civil War on this railroad. It, it really fueled my, my desire to, re to research. Okay, so to the war. In February 62, the Federals came to Nashville after taking Fort Donaldson. Nashville wasn't properly protected. The Federals took took Nashville, within a couple of months, they had control of all the railroads in, in Middle Tennessee, all the way down to Decatur. And the, the Federals were learning, and it was a kind of learning to go thing, that these railroads could be a really good implement of war to help defeat the Confederates. So what you had was the Federals coming in, stealing these three private railroads, it's war, and using them as weapons against the Confederacy. How do you think the locals felt about that? There, of course, there were some Confederate leaners and, and a few federal leaners here. Most of them were Confederates. They didn't like that. So there were vigilantes 
and other groups that constantly tried to damage that railroad. The Confederates wanted it shut down. The Federals wanted it open to supply men, animals, equipment to the South to get a foothold in the South to help win the war. So in a sense, there were battles over this railroad just like there were battles in the Civil War. It was a battle within, there were battles within the battles. And um, so how would people try to tear up the railroad? Damaging the bridges and trestles was number one because they could be burned and they were, they were expensive and time consuming to rebuild. You could take up rails. This one, I don't know where this was, that's probably a train that was rolling along and maybe the, the Confederates had removed a rail and the train couldn't stop and it flipped. And so here you are with a construction car coming in to try to repair that or take it back to the, to the shop to work on. So 62, 1863, a lot was going on, but I can't talk about all of that because the real action in the Franklin area was in 1864. And there, was, there were concurrent activities on the railroad. Get over here. So Sherman had his eyes on Atlanta and he needed to move a whole lot of supplies to Atlanta to support his tens of thousands of men, horses, mules, and what have you. And he had three railroads to work with. In early 64, the Nashville and Chattanooga, which is, that's the closest way to go, okay? If you got supplies in Nashville, you need, you need them in Chattanooga, and you're gonna go to Stevenson and unload, that's the shortest way to go. But he had planned on 16 trains a day, 10 cars each for several months to, to fill those warehouses in Chattanooga so that if something happened up here, got cut off, he would have plenty to run down the, the Western Atlantic Railroad to supply him. So that's where he wanted to go, but that railroad wasn't in a good enough condition to handle that much traffic. Those were heavy cars and a lot of them. And for whatever reason, this railroad wasn't in as good a shape as the Nashville and Decatur. We'll get to that in a minute. It still needed some work as well. But this railroad was ready before the NNC. And so for a couple of months, and this is probably the most famous thing that this railroad did during the war, for two months, Sherman used th this track to take full cars down to empty at Stevenson. And then they'd come back empty or with prisoners or the wounded back up. So for a couple of months, there was a lot of traffic this way. And that was when the NND really did the best service to the Federals. But it took until about June for the NNC to get repaired. And once it was, then that, that wasn't as important anymore. It supplied locally. And then the Federals wore this thing out. It went back and forth with that. So our railroad helped Sherman a lot, didn't help the Confederacy, it helped Sherman a lot for about two months. So Sherman had the NNC fixed up, but the NND concurrently, the NND wasn't in the best shape. And there are four guys, all Federals, There. All Federals who helped get the NND in good shape. Grenville Dodge was a Federal general. Sherman told him, to, as he's moving across the state towards Chattanooga, stop off around Pulaski, inventory the bridges. Almost every bridge on the NND and every trestle was in bad shape. They needed replacement. And so Dodge ended up building five bridges and about 20 trestles from the wood standing around in the trees, in, in the forest. And he was set up around Madridge Ridge where the tunnel was, a lot of trees there. So they put up sawmills, cut wood for, for cross ties and trestles and what have you. So he ended up replacing every structure that needed replacing, which is almost all of them. But what he wasn't very good at was building bridges they could do trestles really well. So he put a lot of trestles where there should have been a bridge, which means that a lot of these 
structures that were trestles, where they should have been a bridge, were going to get washed out eventually. So believe it or not, right behind him, just weeks behind Dodge, came Boomer, who was a contractor, private citizen in Chicago, who got the contract for replacing his poorly located trestles with bridges. And Boomer came in. The best I can figure is that he, he put in 22 to 29 trestles, uh, replaced trestles with bridges, including the one that we saw at, at Franklin. So with these two together, the ND was now open, but it, it wasn't protected because if Sherman's going to rely upon supplies going down, he's got to have a railroad, he's got to have it protected because there are people like Forrest and Hood who have other ideas. So for protection, back in the old days, the protection for the, for the railroads were, were camps. And then it went to stockades, which were open forts. And that didn't work very well. So Captain Merrill, who's famous for a lot of his maps, designed in early 1864 blockhouses. And Colonel Ennis and the, the first Michigan engineers and mechanics built them. They built 36 along the railroad. And they were different because they had a roof. All of them had roofs, the best I can tell, and they were really heavy. These logs, there's one layer of logs here and two there. Those are about 18 to 20 inches wide, thick, those logs are, with loopholes. You can see loopholes for shooting through and a little trench around it. That's, that worked pretty well until Forrester Hood came along with an overwhelming force, and that, that wasn't going to stand. So they, Forrest would, would burn it, threaten to kill everybody in it, and they generally, some of them fought back and got lucky, but that did a really pretty good job. And that was the last form of protection in the Civil War because there was nothing after that. The war ended, and that was the last of the three, the three forms. Okay, the tunnel. I'm, I would speak a whole lot more about this when I go to Pulaski, but I've got to say that the six miles from, let's say, Aspen Hill, Pulaski's up here. Aspen Hill, the, the Madrid's Ridge is along here. There's the Tennessee-Alabama line, the Elk River, Prospect, the tunnel. This six miles was really, was really <coughs> fascinating because it had a huge, it had the tunnel with a huge trestle, another bridge, another bridge over the Elk River. It had uh, a roundhouse for, for spinning trains around. It had sawmills here. There was a, a contraband camp here at, at Tunnel Hill that held hundreds of, of displaced African-Americans, former enslaved people. Um, there was, what am I missing here? Block houses, there, were, there was a block house here and two there. And all these trains coming through. You remember Sherman was running a whole lot of trains through here in April and May and part of June. It's really kind of interesting because there's a lot of construction taking place here and how they managed, I guess they had to do the best they could. Sometimes you couldn't run trains through, but think of all the activity here with, with Dodge's soldiers all in here, the contraband camp, the rivers, um, the, there are two forts here as well at, that we know of at the Elk River. All this traffic through here, it would have been a fascinating place to be, especially in April and May. So what I've done is put together a little timeline. Don't get too worried about this. What it, what it shows is in the tunnel area, November through June 63 to 64, here's Dodge building trestles. Boomer came right behind him, replacing trestles. Ennis was building blockhouses. Sherman's trains were coming through on the loop. And then the, the, the contraband camp was open in January. So if you look up and down there, you can see how busy this area was, especially in, in April and May. It was just, it's incredible. I wish I'd, no, no, I, don't, I wish I didn't there. I, wasn't, I didn't want to be there, but I'd like to have pictures of it. It's just amazing. So fighting wise, the most significant battles on the railroad came in the fall of 1864. 
in September and October, Forrest came from, uh, from Mississippi to Athens. His goal was to destroy what he could along the NND Railroad and then hopefully damage the NNC because this was in the fall of 64 when Sherman was over here. And if you're gonna damage the Federals, you really wanna do it on this railroad, which was still supplying. So he, Forrest did a lot of damage up to about Pulaski, and he went over to, towards the NNC, but realized it was very heavily fortified. He didn't have what it took to do damage there, so he left and went back home after doing a lot of damage north of Pulaski. So he did a lot of damage, but it didn't in any way really change the course of the war. Then it was Hood's turn. Hood marched fr from North Georgia to Florence and crossed in November and, here we go, and met, well, he was with Forrest. They arrived at the railroad, if you will, about Columbia. And they skirmished there, went up past Spring Hill with the famous federal escape of the troops at Spring Hill, and then on to Franklin. And the Battle of Franklin, to me, occurred largely because there was no prepared way for the Federals to get across the river, which really is, is puzzling to me. I haven't researched this, but the crossings, the main crossing in Franklin was damaged in the middle of November by floods. That was, that was the uh, wagon bridge that's near the Harpeth Hotel, where the stones are. That, was, that would have been the best way to get across, except for planking over the, the railroad. But that bridge, that bridge was washed out in the middle of November in storms, and for whatever reason, with these troops coming this way, the Federals hadn't rebuilt that. They could have done it in a day. But the Federals arrived, and they're hoping that pontoons had arrived from Nashville, but they hadn't, and the bridge wasn't replaced. So they had to scurry around trying to get a way to go across that river, but it didn't work out. They were backed up against the river, and if, if Hood chose to attack him, there would be a battle there. And that's what he did, wisely or not. Hood attacked. So bridges are important. The, the lack of bridges here made Franklin largely what it is today. So a close-up look of Franklin, this way. That's the railroad, and that's the old bridge that we, that we saw. When the, the Federals came into Franklin and they, they hunkered down and dug in both sides of Columbia Avenue, they, figured, they knew they had to get across the river. They had an 800 wagon, wagon train. It needed to be saved. So priority number one was hold off Hood if he attacked while they got the wagon train and hopefully eventually men across the river to the safety of Nashville. So what does that mean? There were, there were several ways to get across the river. There was a ford right here between the railroad bridge and, and what looked like pontoons. There was a ford, but it was in bad shape. So they fixed the fort up. There was what's called the county bridge here that shows pontoons, but people thought there were pontoons there during the crossing at night. There weren't. That was a very low bridge right above the, the water level. So they rebuilt that low bridge. The Federals also planked over the railroad bridge so that you could run wagons and, and people across it properly. And they rebuilt the, the wagon bridge near the Harpeth, right there on First Avenue North. So those four things were all being done. The last one completed was the wagon bridge. And so all that day of the 30th of November, the Federals were getting whatever they could across whatever crossing mechanism they had. And just about the time that that last wagon got across the river, Hood attacked. And we, we know what happened there. It was a, a disaster for the Confederates. About midnight, the Hood um, had to watch as the Federals retreated. He didn't know for a while they were retreating. But at midnight, there, was, there were orders for the Federals on this side of Columbia Avenue to basically march up the railroad tracks and go across the planked over railroad bridge. And the troops on the west side of Columbia to come through town, it's dark. They, they were marching in darkness because they didn't want to be seen. It was, it was tough, and there was smoke in the air. It was a, Franklin was a mess, 
horrible mess back then. But the folks on this side of Columbia were to come through town and go across the rebuilt wagon bridge. And they did that, got through maybe three in the morning, and then they burned the wagon bridge and that county bridge and took the planking off of the railroad bridge so that if Hood wanted to follow them, he would be deterred, and he did follow them. He followed them to Nashville and, and was involved in the Battle of Nashville for a couple of days, lost, and then, and then started his miserable 11 and a half day, 100 mile retreat across the Tennessee River, which is, books have been written about that. And I saved a picture here just to give you an idea of what that crossing might look like. This is not the Tennessee River, but that's, that's kind of the idea. Wagon trains coming across the river. It's amazing that Hood got across. There were five things, I won't go into it, five things they had to work really right for them to get across. It's just almost a miracle. For one of them was they didn't have enough pontoons and they stole some from the Federals to make that happen. That's, that's all in the book. So now, Forrest was gone out of the picture. Hood hadn't done any damage either. His, his plan was to draw Sherman out of North Georgia, but that didn't work. Sherman sent Thomas over to deal with him and Thomas dealt with him pretty well. So with both Hood and Forrest gone, there wasn't too much for the, the, the Federals to worry about. So looking back now, let's say it's early to middle 1865, what did the railroads look like? Well, pretty typical, I, the NNC was probably similar, but I haven't studied that one. The Nashville Indicator was subject to different kinds of damage. You had damage by the Confederates and storms, as opposed to by, damage by the Federals, who they, they didn't keep it in the best shape. So crossings, I, the, best, the best I could to count these, the Harpeth, Elk were rebuilt at least eight or nine times during the war. About half of those were because of flooding, the other half were, were, were the Confederates that had damaged it. That's a lot of replacing. The Duck, 11 to 12 times, and that Big Sulphur Creek Trestle, three times, all because of of Confederate damage. The track, you can imagine how tedious it is to try to figure out how many miles of track were damaged, but I figured about half of the 122 miles National Dedicator was replaced. Some of it multiple times, some of it none at all. About half the track was replaced. And then of the 36 blockhouses that were in place for just, what, nine months? 45 rebuilds, which means the average blockhouse was re rebuilt at least once. Tremendous amount of damage and tremendous resources. So you had that going on. And then in September of 1865, when the Federals turned the railroad back over to the, still the three companies, there was damage remaining by the Federals. The track wasn't in very good shape. The bridges and the trestles were, were nothing like they were when the, when the railroad was built. The Mount Pleasant line hadn't been put in yet. Most of the depots were gone. And the majority of the locomotives and the cars were damaged or, or missing. But there we have it, Thomas transferred to the companies in September 1865 after three and a half years of owning those railroads and using them against the Confederates. So now, September 65, the railroads were again trying to operate. They were financially weak, the railroads were in, in pitiful condition, and they had to borrow a lot of money to make repairs, and they bought a lot of equipment at auction from the federal government with loans, with bonds to pay back. But what's amazing to me is that for the first 12 months, starting September of, of 65, the railroads made a, profit, <laughs> made a profit every month, which is pretty amazing considering the condition of the railroads, the crops were terrible, and the inexpensive form of labor that they had for the crops was, was gone. But they, they did okay. It wasn't until early 67 that these three railroads decided they could operate better as one railroad. So they got together, they were gonna call it the NND, but it wasn't until about a year later that it really was called the NND, but that was much more efficient as a corporate guy would, would understand. So, if you look back at the railroad and this story, to me, the way you wrap it up is that after 17 months of operation, 
by the three local companies. The Federals took it, had it for three and a half years to use as a weapon against, against the Confederates, gave it back in terrible shape. And th the main thing this railroad did was to supply Sherman to help him capture Atlanta and help him with his march to the sea, which contributed greatly to the end of the war. So that's not, that's not fair, but it's war, and that's, that's the way it goes. That's it, and I've got some extra slides if you need, and I would love to have some, some good questions or comments. Yes, ma'am. Conception, um, about two months ago, some folks from Columbia and I went to the Duck River because we, we knew from maps where a blockhouse on the north side of the Duck was supposed to be. And we pulled out a map, I saw a photograph taken from probably that same spot that showed where that bridge was. We were standing in almost the same spot. But that site had been bulldozed. You know what happens. It was a scout camp, a boy scout camp, and they bulldozed it to make it better. So any remains of a blockhouse now would be an earthen berm. Like you saw that, that moat, that trench around the blockhouse, you might see that, but the wood's all gone. The blockhouses often had a well inside for water that, that might remain, there might be a little dip there. But I do know of one place that where there are earthen remains that show where the blockhouse was. But that has to be in a remote area because people, progress get in the way of that. And for what it's worth, almost every crossing had a blockhouse. The longer ones had two. There was no blockhouse at Fort Granger here in Franklin because there was a stockade there. But later when Fort Granger was built, right there near the railroad, there was no need for a blockhouse. So it made sense that they were where they were. And I'm really kind of pleased that my research also went up and down the railroad, as I did, studying topo and records, trying to figure out where every blockhouse was. And forget the 36. I knew there were 36, but I didn't want to cheat. So, so I went through, and I, I determined there were 37. And that's fine. I, I originally put it in the book. I got 37, that there were 36. But then I, I figured out that there was a blockhouse I was counting at the Elk that I don't think was really there. So I was able to edit the book and honestly say, I think we've got this. But you never know. This is, this is tough. But yeah. And there were blockhouses on the National Chattanooga. All these railroads have blockhouses. The N&D wasn't, wasn't special that way. Where would you like the depot to be? Near, I'm being careful with this, near the railroad. Ideally, it, it would be in the gravel lot where PD's is. It's owned by the family. But I don't want to go around saying we've got to have that property. That's not a smart thing to do. I'd like for it to go. Mm -hmm. it, there are not that many places it can go that make sense where property is available. Ideally, it would go there, about 100 feet from the, the freight depot. We know where it is. I think there's still stone foundation there that we could locate and reuse. That would be the place to go. And would, would it be a museum? No, we, we can do better than that. Franklin needs the structure, I think. It would be a wonderful thing to have, but it could be a visitor center or a meeting place or restaurant. Lots of things it, it could be. While we're at it, that's the floor plan. So the railroad was over here. No, I think you can, no. It's a floor plan, okay. So there were, there were three rooms, one for colored. That's pretty faded, isn't it? Okay, general and ladies. So there are three larger rooms, and then the ticket office, if you will, and then restrooms, and then a baggage area. So if we were to, if people were to rebuild the depot, it's got, we could build it like it was, and the rooms are, are interesting enough and of a decent size that something could be done there that would be attractive and profitable. It's got to make sense economically. So that's what I'd like to see rebuilt. But I can't do it by myself. And I think we're going to build a lot of momentum and 
and put a team together to see what that whole area is. 8,500 is of an acre. What could the area be that also included a depot feature? What would be there in addition to the depot feature? And conceptualize that, draw it up, put a dollar amount on it, and maybe make an offer if that's what it comes to, or look for another location. So that, when the, when the book sales are, are tailing off, you know, and I go riding off in the sunset with the book, I, I still got the depot, because that's really, that would be a wonderful thing to have. But the book is also important because it helps to justify the railroad and what it did during the Civil War. And in my opinion, the story of the railroad needs to be woven into better into the larger story of the Battle of Franklin, for instance. It's a big part of it. It can be a little bigger part than it is now. So that's my goal. Yes, sir. Did you ever run into whether there's a lawsuit to block the railroad for its construction? I'm asking this because I, I live on Franklin Road in an old house, and in my research in that house, ran into that, that they he sued the owner of the house sued to uh, block the railroad and lost, obviously. And then what's, what I thought was interesting was when the railroad crosses Spencer Creek, it goes over angle to the right, goes right next to the house, and then angles back away. And I sort of assumed that the railroad did that for spite. I may be wrong about that, but it makes sense. You know, they might have done that. Did you run into that? I, I, did, I did not. I did. When you research something like this, you come across a lot of topics to say, that's really interesting, but you can't stop. Yeah, I make notes sometimes, but you can't stop and go down that rabbit hole. I did see some, there were some lawsuits, but I didn't focus on this. Fortunately, what I got was enough to write a book on, but I don't know about that. And I've never seen in print, not that I would have, that the railroad during those days of laying out intentionally went here or there. There is a chapter in here about the early railroad. And I've got a fair amount of documentation as to who the board members were, where the surveys were, how they decided to run the railroad a certain way through Brentwood instead of the other way, but it didn't. I didn't see anything about avoiding somebody's property yeah. out of spite. <laughs> huh? And it wasn't the depot, was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. What's the difference between a trestle and a bridge? A trestle generally takes the railroad over an area that doesn't have much water running through it. Like the, the great big one at, at um, Sulphur Creek in Alabama, you saw a creek running through there, but it didn't really carry a lot of water. So that trestle made sense. A bridge, so a trestle, the foundation, the, the load is carried from the tracks vertically down to the soil on a trestle. Whereas a bridge generally goes over a creek or a river that has high flows it needs to stay out of the water because if, if you put a trestle there like, like Dodge did and had to pull them out and put bridges in, that foundation would get scoured in a storm and wash out. So those are the, those are the two things. Yes, yes sir. The uh, current railroad runs from Brentwood down through Athens, but it goes down through Lewisburg. Do you know when that was built and why they abandoned and, and indeed yeah. the I, I'm going to be close on this. I think it was in the 1920s or 30s that the sizes of the locomotives and the cars got too great for that 20 by 15 tunnel. And that was still, it didn't compete with the l &N because it was the same company. They just put a track over on the other side and they pulled that, that track up. And it was because the tunnel was great for 1860, but not for 1925. And you may know that that occurred a lot down to Athens and that where there used to be tracks, there are now walking trails for horses and what have you, and it's called rails to trails, which is a really, really good thing, a good use. And then the rebuilding the block down here, um, those are phenomenal numbers on a rebuild. Do, do, do they know why they were so vulnerable and didn't try to change it? Is there any insight into that? 
I don't have a lot of insight. My gut is they didn't know what better to do. And they, they just couldn't put a whole lot of men at every blockhouse. There was a shortage of, of troops. So they did the best they could and were prepared to rebuild. It was only for nine months. I guess they figured, hey, we're getting it done even by replacing these blockhouses. I guess with, I guess the resources needed to be spent elsewhere, but I don't know for sure. I've never seen why that was. It was pretty wasteful, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, what was the economic incentive for building up the railroad went from Nashville to Decatur, but didn't cross the Tennessee River? So did, did, did products and stuff and people forward to the Tennessee River then and pick up on a railroad out of Decatur, or was it just to take produce and people north to Nashville from the south, from that area between Nashville and Decatur, or what? Okay. So this is a map from 1863 or 64. So there's the N&D, and there's the railroad over here, the MNC. And originally, the railroad did go across. You see that dash right there? Those are, are columns, if you will, or piers that supported the railroad. The railroad came all the way through. The MNC came all the way through Decatur. So before the war, there was, a, there was connectivity here. But the Federals actually destroyed that bridge to keep the Confederates co from coming down. They destroyed that bridge and then built a pontoon bridge there to help get supplies across. That was much less e efficient. So there was a bridge there. Did that get rebuilt after the war? It did. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, there's speculation that the railroad south of Lewisburg Pike right about where Collins Farm is, that that area was trestled. Did you come across that at any time? I've been asked my opinion several years ago. Some Battle of Franklin Trust folks asked me because they knew I researched this, and I sent back a pretty lengthy reply. I gave them like seven reasons why that would not have been a, a trestle. I'm pretty sure, first of all, there was no mention of a trestle. I inventoried and looked at records really thoroughly and there was reference to almost every trestle on the railroad, but not one there. Another key point is that that was not a very sh long stretch, so it wouldn't have been that much material to put in there. There are lots of reasons, but I just, I don't believe that there was a trestle there. It would be nice to know, important to know, related to the Battle of Franklin. But would the pike have run a little bit further south than where it is today? The, the actual Lewisburg pike. I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I think it was right there. Thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, so I didn't see you back there. Hello. Hello. Uh, where, where the current train depot is, uh, or the, the thought of the depot, and there's a pedestrian bridge that goes over Kensington Park and Port Ranger. Is that built? Was that originally there during that time of the war? A bridge you get over the river there to Port Ranger? No. No, it's not that old a bridge. And before then, I, I have no record that there was a bridge there. That was for our convenience as a modern society. But, but the depot was on the other side of the river? The, the, the depot was adjacent to, it was on the gravel lot yeah. on the town side, if you will, of the river. Yeah. Same side as PD's, the freight depot. They were right there, pretty much side by side. And there were several passenger depots, like there were several freight depots, because they got burned and what have you. And that was the last of at least four passenger depots that were in that place. They were too small, made it larger, got destroyed during the Civil War, etc. That was at least number four. That People didn't get off there to go to Port Granger, or soldiers get off there on a, a ride north. How would they get over to I don't know. They might just walk across the, the bridge. I, I don't know that. That's a really good question. But yeah, Fort Granger was quite, I'm trying to picture that, it was quite the deal. There were hundreds of acres extended for Fort Granger, and there were a lot of men there and a lot of, a lot of equipment. So that's a really, that's a good point I need to, to consider. Thanks, Andrew. 
I knew you'd ask a tough question. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. You can get into Port Granger off Liberty, um, and there's, it's, it's an easy walk in as opposed to try to come from the other side where it's real steep. Um, it would, it would be, they could come across the bridge, you know, the, however they would normally come from Franklin going towards Brentwood and then just curve around. That's true. Come in the back end, the back side. That's, that's true. Yes, sir. Can you comment on, uh, so the days leading up to Battle of Franklin on November 30th, it's coming up through Columbia, Spring Hill. What role and what state the railroad was in in those immediate days before and after the battle? It was in operating condition before the battle. The Confederates, as they came up through Columbia, Spring Hill, what have you, the railroad was, they, dis, they destroyed, the Confederates did, the bridges and trestles, well, mostly bridges, but they didn't damage the railroad as much as you might think. They might have figured they might need it later on. So that railroad was operating all the way to Nashville. And once the Confederates were on the other side of the Harpeth River, preparing for the Battle of Franklin, Hood, made a big effort to repair the railroad all the way down to Decatur to bring supplies up to help him with Nashville. So here the Confederates were re repairing it for them. It didn't make much difference, but when Hood was at um, Traveler's Rest, r railroad was being repaired, and the railroad runs right by there. It's really another great, great location, a great house to visit. So the railroad was not far from being ready to use at that time. Cricket stripping. Brian, I can't believe you're not going to give me a hard time. <laughs> no way. Okay. I will make a comment, though. On I knew it. On how, how they may have gotten to Fort Ranger's town. And you mentioned that low bridge across the harbor, which you call the county bridge. They could have come, come that direction if they wanted to and crossed the river there. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it worked. That was a cheap, just barely above the surface. Um, bridge. And I'll make one point here that, yes, the Confederates, I look at it a different way, the Federals wanted pontoons waiting for them in Franklin when they arrived on the 30th, and they weren't there because somebody messed up in Nashville and sent that pontoon train out Murfreesboro Pike, if it was towards Murfreesboro, Laverne, went the wrong way, and they caught it and sent it across country to Franklin, by, by the time they got there, the Federals had already rebuilt the bridges and what have you. Didn't need them, sent the pontoon bridges back. But that one drawing I showed you, it was a Merrill drawing, I think, showed pontoons there at the, at the county bridge. No, at the county bridge. But the, the troops who were crossing at night, the midnight, they thought they were on a pontoon because it was dark and they were so close to the water. But I think it was Cox, General Cox, who said that was a misconception. Even some of the officers reported that they crossed the pontoon bridge, but there, there wasn't one there. But that's a, back to your point, they used whatever they could to get across, and that would be one way to do it. Well, there, there is a diary entry that comes, it's on one of the uh, trail markers on Fort Rancher. And it's a diary entry from a Union soldier who says they were building a foot, a foot bridge for us to cross the harbor. And I just kind of assumed that was it. Well, the footbridge could have been the wagon bridge. It, it would handle foot traffic as well. So it's one of those two probably, either the county bridge or maybe the wagon bridge. It's pretty bad. This was when they were building Fort Ranger, I think. Mm -hmm. Not actually during the war. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. We'll have to investigate that. I guess we will. <laughs> a, a sequel. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, thank you for letting me talk. Oh. I really love talking about this. And the main thing for me isn't the fact that I'm able to, to go around and speak to people or is this the book. It's just I really feel blessed to be the one to write this book. That I did it before somebody else. So 
I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful. Thank you. Mm-hmm.